Oh shit, is that a purple? Whoa, is that a legendary? Whoa, is that a fucking pearl? Yo, oh, oh, I, I, I'm good. I, I'm good. Yeah. So we all know the different rarities in Borderlands, right? You got white, green, blue, purple. The incarnation of perfection itself. A legendary. Is that a fucking madhouse? This rarity system originally used by Borderlands has now found its way into other games as basically the universal color rating system for items. But Borderlands being Borderlands, they went a step beyond. What if I told you there were rarities of both legendary. Even from the get-go on Borderlands 1, Gearbox was expanding the rarity systems in its DLC. But this wasn't on purpose. No, uh, bonus rarities in Borderlands actually got their start because of a glitch. For whatever reason in Borderlands 1, there was a glitch where some legendaries could in incorrectly drop as white rarity and have super crazy stats. The community dubbed these as pearlescence. That's right, it was the community who named them not Gearbox. Of course though, Gearbox couldn't have these unbalanced guns just hanging around ruining the balance of the game, so when they patched it, they also got to work on what we now know as pearlescence today. At least with the Commander Nox DLC with a new and improved version of Perlescence. Gearbox had taken this little thing they saw the community really enjoy and doubled down on it in what was one of the most important decisions they would ever make. I mean, not really, but sure. This is what opened up the floodgates for more rarities above legendaries in the coming games. I already talked about pearls a ton in my Rise and Fall of Pearls video, so I won't go over every item individually, but I will give you the general rundown. Pearls and Beer 1 are without a doubt the best items in the game. They were also by far the rarest thing in the game, only dropping from Lance Chest, Select Enemies in the Nox DLC, and the game's only raid boss, Cromorax the Invincible. Pearls being so rare, and more importantly, so good, is the reason that Borderlands 1's endgame chase is still alive today. People who like BL1 really like BL1, and Pearls are a huge part of that. But BL1? That's old news. The new kill in the block is BL2, smashing 2k in Gearbox records that have still yet to be broken. I mean, probably, I, I haven't really fact-checked that, but I'm sure that's still accurate. And like BL1's launch, new rarity stopped at Legendary, but that's not including the new rarity they added in between Purple and Legendary, known as e -Tech standing for Iridium Technology. These guns shot pure splash damage and were pretty rare to find. Their quality also really varied. You had darts and spikers, which sucked, black guns, which sucked, blasters, which sucked. Then you had the plasma casters, which were awesome, and the launchers taking the medal as the best, with the Topnia being the fan favourite. That was all that was in the game at launch, though. That was until Borderlands 2's first campaign DLC, releasing on October 16, 2012, Captain Skull and her pirate's booty. Once completing the DLC's main story, new character Shade will be given a new side quest called Hyperius the Invincible, which of course meant that this DLC added a new raid boss to the ranks among Terramorphus the Invincible and Vermivorous the Invincible. In fact, it added two. As well as Hyperius, there was also Master the Gee the Invincible, available to fight right after you beat Hyperius for the first time. These two new raids were not like the others though. The game makes sure of this as these aren't your ordinary raid bosses, these are Seraph Guardians. Identical to regular raids, but with one incredibly important detail. When killed in UBHM, they drop a new currency known as Seraph Crystals, as well as a guaranteed item with its own pink colored rarity known as a Seraph. The Seraph Crystals can be used in the hidden Seraph Vendor in Oasis to buy many types of Seraph gear. Going through all of them, we got the Actualizer, a pretty by the books Hyperion. An SMG with pretty decent damage but reduced bullet speed. The Seraphim, an absolute dog shit dull assault rifle that always comes in fire but tries to make up for it by having this really cool skin. And the Blood of the Seraphs, which is a relic that gives you more maximum health and health regen. Very similar to the Blood of Terramorphus, which, like this relic, sucks. These are the only things that you'll find in the vendor in UVHM, but that's because, as I mentioned before, the raid bosses have their own Seraph weapon drops that are guaranteed on kill in UVHM. These drops are available to buy from the vendors in normal and true Vault Hunter modes, even though you can't get the crystals outside of UVHM. The Seraphs dropping from Hyperius are the Wretcher, a corrosive only gun that shoots slow arcing energy orbs that explode on impact and deal pure splash damage like an E-Tech. Also like an E-Tech, it's really bad! They also drop the Evolution, a Seraph shield that passively gives a really small amount of health regen and also is a really strong adaptive shield, running your elemental resistance up to 86%. And of course, you got the Tattler, which is personally one of my favourite Seraphs. It's a Bandit SMG that comes in any element and always spawns with a blade. It has a very widespread as you would expect from a bandit SMG, but it makes up for it with really high damage and fire rate. But moving on to Master Gee's drops, we've got the Ahab, a really high damage Torg launcher that shoots an arcing harpoon instead of a rocket. It's mostly known today for being the other half of the most infamous glitch in Borderlands 2, Impa Having. When playing a Salvador and Gunzerking with an Ahab and another Captain Scarlet gun known as the Pimpernel, all of the Pimpernel's bonus splash damage pellets that split after the shot was fired take on the Ahab's damage for whatever reason. This means that you can basically one-shot raid bosses and surprisingly the glitch was like never fixed. You can still do it today to the community's dismay. In fact, Gearbox instead actually added a better gun for this glitch, but that one's a while away, so I won't spoil it just yet. D also drops the Patriot, which is a decent well of sniper with decreased projectile speed. And the final gun Gee drops is the Devastator, which has an incredibly 
fitting name because like if you get this gun to drop you will be devastated it's a tall pistol that only shoots one shot at a time and on top of that say it with me now decrease projectile speed why didn't you say it with me but that decrease projectile speed is like to an insulting degree where if you hit something i would be impressed but that's all the original seraphs some really shine above the rest but all in all they were kind of bad right not that you'd know this at the time of its launch because originally seraph guardians were restricted to one kill a day even though most of the items cost about 120 crystals and both of them only drop like eight at a time this was quickly resolved though since everyone relentlessly complained about it at the time forcing gearbox to make them vulnerable bosses but this move is up to november 20 2012 with the release of borderlands 2 second campaign dlc mr torg's campaign of carnage and with it a new seraph guardian and a new seraph ender let's not waste any time and just get right into the items this time you got the crossfire a bouncing beta grenade that i'm absolutely in love with listen do yourself a favor and farm 120 crystals then buy a longbow slag variant in normal mode you're gonna have a good time man you want a normal mode so you don't accidentally down yourself with it and you only really want it to slag enemies this is actually probably my go-to for raid bosses like terror and the dragons also a heads up the item card on it is bugged so it won't show zero fuse when it has it instead it will show a solid one so double check that when following it. next is the meteor shower basically a better version of the legendary merv grenade the bonus package from the base game but now with even more child grenades on contact really fun on accident in my opinion then we got the punchy don't buy the punchy dude it's just a mid roid shield go treat yourself to a love thumper if you want one and spend your hard-earned seraph crystals on something else like the smut no don't buy this either it's a high capacity absorb shield which only has absorb chances from 20 to 54 percent it kind of just lives in the shadow of the sham with its much better 77 to 94 percent absorb chance but perhaps on a better note there's also the might of the seraph's relic which is all about melee bonus melee damage and melee override skill cooldown which makes this relic perfect for melee salvador which is totally a build that exists i'm telling you grab two rapiers this relic and a good roid shield don't let me catch your ass using the punchy though and you're gonna have a good time that's all for the vendor but not all for the dlc as we've got another seraph guardian known as pyro peak to deal with he drops the big boom blaster which is a must have for a grenade build being a booster shield that's boosters give you grenade ammo he also drops the O negative, a decent transfusion grenade that sadly can't spawn with zero fuse time. And his final drop, the Hoplite, which is a multiplicative Fable Tortoise. What this means is the more people you have in your party wearing the Hoplite, the more shield capacity you have up 20% per person. But the catch is, that goes the same for reducing your movement speed, so no one who likes fun will be using this shield. It also front loads all of your health into your shield, which means that you will have 1 HP at all times, apart from sometimes when it says you have 0, I don't really get that. Moving on into the future though, it's a new year and therefore we got some new gear. In another new DLC, releasing on January 15th, 2013, it was Sir Hamelock's Big Game Hunt, adding in yet another vendor and two more raids. I say raids because only one of them was a Seraph Guardian, to the dismay of fans. This Guardian was Verastus the Invincible, probably the hardest raid boss in the game, even to today. But they make up for this by having some of the best loot. What loot was that, you may ask? Well, they dropped the Hawkeye, which to be honest, I just wanted to get out of the way so I could talk about the next one, but it's a Jacob Sniper with a lot of zoom and a lot of crit damage. 580% to be precise. Its fire rate is quite lacking and I can never really seem to get a use out of it. Probably best on a Sniper Zero build though. And then we have the gold standard of all Seraph weapons, the Interfacer. The Interfacer is a Hyperion shotgun that shoots a large amount of pellets that at a certain distance split into more pellets and they also crisscross making the gun kind of hard to land sometimes but that's what makes this gun so fun. This is a gun that rewards you for good playing positioning because the damage in the interface's sweet spot is almost unparalleled by any other gun in the game. It also has baked in 60% crit and you don't have decreased movement speed while aiming down sights. Just an overall amazing gun. Those two are all Vora drops though and the vendor only has two items as well besides this relic and they are the Infection, a Malawan pistol mainly focused on corrosive damage over time that really just doesn't do anything like dude it's so bad <laughs> but the vendor does make up for it with the lead storm one of the best guns in the whole game it's a blood of assault rifle that shoots arc shots into the air that split after a certain distance covering whatever you're shooting at in a rain of bullets the name is like super fitting and that just leaves this dlc seraph relic being the breath of the seraphs which is a hyped up tenacity relic tenacity. gives you bonus health regen and damage when getting a second win from fight for your life it's okay but there are definitely better relics out there the next dlc to release after the ham hands experience didn't actually have anything to do with Seraphs. No, instead, on April 2nd, 2013, the Ultimate Vault Hunter mode upgrade pack was released, with its main attraction being 11 more levels were going to be added to the game. But we're going to be focused on the other thing and added. Well, what was that? Pearls! That's right, they added Pearls back. When this was announced, you best believe all the Borderlands fans were hyping this up to be a big deal. Little did they know that Pearls and Borderlands 2 as a collective were just going to kind of suck. There are some good ones, don't get me wrong, like the Butcher 
with a saw bar, but Borderlands 2's pearls were incredibly lackluster. And as I said before, if you want to hear about these pearls, I mean, the pearl video is right there. I mean, what are you doing? Just, what, you don't want to learn? You don't want to be the coolest person in your cold I Come on, I'd watch your pearl video. But after the release of these pearls, next up was Borderlands 2 getting back on that Seraph grind with Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep, releasing on June 25th. 2013. Its vendor probably has my favourite shield in the game, the Antagonist. It's a deflection shield that takes the damage you get hit and then chucks it back at the enemy with 880% more damage. And did I mention that this damage was also slag? That's right, this shield already has very decent capacity, damage reduction, and bullet deflection, and also slags enemies for you. Truly one of the best. That's not all it can do though, as the Antagonist is used for another one of Borderlands 2's most famous glitches, insta-killing Hyperius the Invincible. All you need is an Antagonist and a high damage Jacob shotgun. I personally recommend and an off-handed Orphan Maker on Salvador or a Hydra on any other character. All you have to do for this glitch is to stand next to Hyperius and then shoot their shield. The damage from your shotgun will get reflected back into you after hitting Hyperius' shield, but then the antagonist will deflect it back with 880% more damage, and this will keep stacking tons and tons and tons of times over the course of near seconds until the Slag Orb just kind of spawns through his shield and then it will one-shot him. So happy hunting those crystals. This Seraph Ender also has another one of my favorites, the Florentine. It's a Seraph Plasma Caster that is both slag and shock that's right two elements it's super fun to use but sadly op levels and above really don't have it scale that well despite its elemental output and damage the vendor's also got the seeker which is a torg ar that asks do you want to hit a crit no. oh yeah you know i think i will hit a crit that sounds like a good no but no you only get body shots. So yeah, the Seekers bullets home in on your enemies, but only to their bodies. It's really frustrating trying to use that and get anything out of it, really. And that just leaves Dragon Keep's Relic, the Shadow of the Ancients. Kind of an interesting one. It gives 42% chance to fire a second shot, basically giving every character Zero's two fang skip. And that just leaves the final Seraph Guard, or should I say, Guardians, the Ancient Dragons of Destruction. These guys are not only the droppers of three more Seraph items, but they also, to my knowledge, drop the most Seraph crystals and a really out of any other raid boss. Their drops are the Omen, a pretty decent TDL shotgun that has a circle of pellets that move in and out of each other, kind of like an interface, only slower and shittier, so basically just TDL things. All being said, it is kind of decent on Axton though. They also got the Blockade, a massive damage reduction shield, given about 52.5% damage reduction while equipped. It's supposed to give you about an extra 450%, but it's bugged, and it was never fixed. Yay, Gearbox. And their last drop is the Stinger. It's very similar to the Stalker, a pearl that was released in the first UVHM upgrade pack, where it has very slow projectiles, making what would have been a great gun into something that no one will ever use. What's with these Seraphs and taking away projectiles, dude? But that's every Seraph in Borderlands 2, so let me know in the comments what your favourite is. But if you think we're done with Borderlands 2, well you're an idiot, because you saw the cold open. Like, there's obviously more. Next thing to come out of Borderlands 2's legendary DLC cycle was the second Ultimate Vault Hunter Mode upgrade pack that added Digi Peak, OP levels, yada yada, more pearls, they added more pearls, baby! Two of which suck, one that's okay, and one that's good. Well, that was anticlimactic. You know what? Friendship with BO2 is over. TPS is my new best friend. Because Borderlands the Pre-Sequel actually also added its own new rarity into the mix. Not in the base game though. They only added a new weapon and a new element type. Hadn't gone the trifecta of adding a rarity yet. That wouldn't happen until March 24th, 2015. The release of the steel yet to be dethroned. Best steel seen the whole Borderlands franchise. The Claptastic Voyage. This DLC added a lot. Legendaries, unique, super rare farms, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're going to talk about the glitch rarity weapons. Glitch rarity, sporting a similar pink color to the Seraphs, are actually quite different from all the other bonus rarities seen in the franchise thus far. Instead of being solely focused on making new unique gear, they instead gave purple gear incredibly unique properties to make them feel really special. This was actually a banger idea, since the Seraphs did end up kind of being very hit or miss when everything was said and done. Doing this makes already good guns feel new and special, while also having so much variety since there are so many gun variations to pull from. But let's get into what a glitch rarity special effect actually is though. Every glitch gun you get to drop, either from the Claptrap DLC bosses or special glitch chests, will have a code that tells you what special effects your gun will have and how likely you are to trigger these effects on reload on a rank to 1 to 4. First part of the code is O for overload. This is the red glitch. It makes one shot from your gun do super high damage while also giving you a huge kick of recoil and knockback when you shoot it. It also decreases the fire rate, but the damage more than makes up for it. We then have L for loop, the yellow glitch. This glitch makes your gun constantly fire its mag while also regenerating ammo. Sort of a hybrid between a butcher and a chopper. This is the most sought after glitch to get on guns as the fire rate increase absolutely destroys everything. Next is M for multi-shot, the green glitch. This basically turns any gun you're using into a pseudo shotgun, even 
shotguns. The effect is that you fire your gun with its normal fire rate, but the pellet count and spread are massively increased. I love using this on any high fire rate gun like SMGs or like a Vladov pistol. It just deals massive damage. It's also really good on shotguns as well. Like if you get a casual Ravager with this glitch, the pellet count is wild. This is the type of stuff that will speed kill with Jury, you know. The last glitch in the error code is A for Amp. The blue glitch. It's honestly kind of hard to tell when you get it because most glitch guns already shine blue, so you kind of just have to pay attention for when you get it. This glitch does what it sounds like. You get 200% amp damage to your weapon and 0.43% amp drain. It's not really that good. Like, don't get me wrong, it's better than not having a glitch, but if you're farming for god rolls, I would leave A on zero so it doesn't get in the way of better rolls when reloading. Also, you remember when I said glitch weapons only take up to purple weapons from pre sequels base game? Well, I lied. <laughs> there are actually two unique glitch weapons in pre -sequel. They show off two of the glitches each. The first one you'll be able to find is the Heartful Splooger, which is a one-time item guaranteed to spawn from this chest at the back of the Cluster Overlook map behind the Holy Spirits. The Heartful Splooger is a dull blaster laser that always comes in corrosive and can only spawn with the error code that has four loop and four multi-shot. It's pretty decent, but honestly nothing that you need to pick up. Same goes for the other unique glitch weapon, the Cutie Killer, found in TK Baha's house after doing the Sum of Some Fears side quest. The Cutie Killer is a bandit SMG that wants to be a tattler like so bad but it just can't commit to the bit like it's got bad fire rate terrible spread and low damage and it cops the two worst glitches for an smg amp and overload it's okay but i personally would just use it for grinder food for any other glitch weapon soon after the claptrap dlc though 2k australia would shut down the dlc cycle for borderlands the pre-sequel would unceremoniously come to an end cancelling a new campaign dlc in the process but i'm getting off topic years passed after that four years to be exact and the fans were anticipating the next game in the series borderlands 3 and after its original reveal at PAX, we were stoked to see what they would show for E3 2019. And damn, was that a good trailer. Really getting me hyped for- Is that a fucking new Borderlands 2 DLC? That's right, a new Borderlands 2 DLC was revealed to set the stage for Borderlands 3. This would introduce the Tails characters into the main series, show what's next for the Vault map, and holy, a new rarity added to the game. This is gonna be si- uh... Well, the DLC wasn't all bad. I mean, sure, it ruined OP levels and certain raid bosses, but new best loot midget farm, new best tubby farm, and oh yeah, what's the reason we're here again? Oh yeah, a new rarity! This rarity was called Effervescence. They follow pre-sequels example instead of being all unique guns, they're actually instead souped up versions of previous guns with a rainbow skin and usually made into fire. I'll show you what I mean by this as we go through them. First one is the Nirvana which is just a slightly higher damage hellfire that can only drop from badass saplings with only a 1% drop chance. Next is the Infection Cleaner which is a rainbow fire version of the Pearl known as the Avenger, still complete with its bouncing Betty TDL reload and passive ammo regen. It can only drop from new Pandoran soldiers at a 0.9% drop chance. Next is the World Burn, which is a way better Nukem that now only deals fire damage. I remember before when I said that Gearbox later added a better gun for Bimba having? Well, this is it. Insanely high base damage, and honestly, it's just crazy how good it is. Top it all off, it has a 20% drop chance from Lieutenant Bolson in the Dole Abandon as a part of the side quest BFFFs. Unless you're in normal mode, to which it'll only be a 10% drop chance. Still in that same quest, we've got the Hot Mama, which has the same drop rates that drop from Lieutenant Hoffman. This is the first fully unique effervescent gun. It talks to you for one, then it actually has 100% accuracy while aiming down sights, even if you're playing as Gage with Max Anarchy, making it a awesome gun on them. In addition, every time you score a crit with it, your crit damage will stack up 50%, but you can only gain stacks every 5 seconds, and each stack only lasts 12 seconds. So you do the math, because I, I don't want to, I don't know if it's if that's good or not. But that does make it pretty good on a sniper zero. Another effervescent that was supposed to drop during the BFFFFFFFF. Another effervescent that was supposed to drop during that mission was the fire drill, which was just an infinity with a rainbow skin and fire damage. I say supposed to, because though it can be found in the code, the gun doesn't drop anywhere in the game. It's supposed to drop from Lieutenant Angbar, who can drop the infinity pistol just normally, but likely due to the classic gearbox typo in the code, it isn't able to drop. Next is the Unicorn Explosion, which is a rainbow version of the Sword Splosion from the Dragon Keep DLC, but instead of swords, it shoots unicorns, of course. So every time you equip it or shoot it, it nays at you and it isn't annoying at all. It's a pretty cool drop though on how you actually get it. Years ago at this point, there was a quest in the Dragon Keep DLC from a guy named Mr. Miz. He wanted to sell you an amulet, which was incredibly overpriced, and when you bought it, he said its purpose will reveal itself in time. Naturally, all Borderlands fans immediately thought he was full of shit, and on every subsequent playthrough, we chose the opposing option from buying the amulet, which was to punch him in his stupid fucking 
face. But little did we know that in the Five of Sanctuary DLC, after you rescue Bud Stallion from Helios Fallen and feed the Meridium while wearing the amulet, you will be able, once per playthrough, to get the Unicorn Explosion. Honestly, whoever thought back to bring back the amulet is a fucking genius. Let that guy make BL4. I'm sure he's got it. This DLC also has its own raid boss, but sadly it isn't a Seraph Guardian. But they still drop plenty of legendaries and they have their own guaranteed effervescent drops. To beat them, however, you'll need to find other pieces of gear specifically made to use in that fight. First up is the Mouthwatch Relic, which you'll get from beating the DLC. It's just a special relic that gives you bonus assault rifle damage passively, but way more damage with the next item you'll need, the Toothpick. This is a fire-only dial assault rifle with an astonishing amount of pellets. It's like the assault rifle version of the Sandhawk. With this gun, you'll be able to fight the new raid without trouble, especially combined with the last piece of gear you'll need, the Retainer. The Retainer is a shield that is always alkaline, meaning that it gives you corrosive immunity. And when equipped with the Toothpick in your hands while on the arriving deep map, you'll have super speed and super jumping abilities. You're now all ready to fight BL2's final raid boss, Haterax the Invincible. The strat is to use the speed and jump height from the Toothpick pick retainer combo to parkour up this cliff where Haterax can't hit you, then barrage them with a toothpick until they fall over. After that, it's better to swap to the B-Shield over the retainer just to finish them off and then boom, you got them. After they die, you'll get four chests, three of which can drop effervescence. The first is the easy mode, which is a guaranteed drop from Haterax every time you beat them. It gives buffs specifically for when you're in Digistruct Peak when combined with the other two drops. It gives you 300% max health, a whole extra two minutes of fight for your life duration, and 100% bonus damage for the next item they drop, the Peak Opener. This gun is a 1 in 3 drop chance and it is amazing. It's a redunker blaster that is now always shock and has an insane fire rate to the point where it might as well be a completely different gun. It's honestly a must have for characters like Maya and Accident. But as mentioned before, its main use is for Digi Peak and if you want it to be even easier, you can put on the hard carry. Another assault rifle relic, this time with less passive damage than the mouthwash, but when combined with the easy mode shield, it does the affirmation effects with the max health and pipe fuel life duration. And those are all of the effervescence and all of the bonus rarities in Borderlands history. While Borderlands 3 didn't have any launch, I don't think anyone was really expecting it to since most of the bonus rarities from other games didn't show up until the DLCs. But as time went on, not a single DLC added a new rarity. When we all came up to Randy and we were like, dude, why? He said that if we changed the Monarch's Assault Rifle's item card to light blue, it would have basically meant that last gen Xbox One S's would explode. Also, you couldn't do crossplay with them, I guess. I'm sure that made sense to someone out there, but the point is, I really hope to see more of these bonus rarities in Borderlands games in the future. They're a perfect way to make that game in the series stand out and make DLCs that much more worth buying. Let me know what your favorite bonus rarity is and what you want to return the most is in the comments. And mate, have a great day, look after yourself, and I uh, know you, you could subscribe or something. I mean, here's a graph. Uh, see ya. But before I end the video for good, you know I gotta shout out my channel members. They are JBH, who stopped an elephant on a rampage by soothing it by playing a song on their recorder. A fucking recorder! Wesker520, who can talk to crows, but only when they're happy. And they're never fucking happy. Angel B, who trained their dog to spit in a spittoon at lols in conversations to be more intimidating. And Chimpy Scrimpy, who can climb faster than they can breathe. It's so funny to watch, just one inhale through their nose. And then, but thank you guys for giving me the extra support. I just really appreciate you guys. I hopefully one of these days I can figure out a better thing to give y'all than just these shoutouts. But for now, if you also want one, the join button's right below the video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.